So good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I'd just like to thank Humberto, first of all, for presenting a very nice overview of, of the computer hall and, and what is critical in running our forecast, and to Peter for the great introduction to ECWF and many things which will come out in this presentation. So Peter's given you some wonderful theoretical and um, hypothetical slides, so to speak, of, of the theory behind it, but this, um, hopefully this talk will give you an overview of actual examples. So thank you very much, and thank you to Julian and everyone else for, for organizing today's virtual event. So just to introduce myself, my name is David Lavers. I'm part of the diagnostics team at ECMWF. And today, I'm just gonna move on to the next slide. Um, Today, I would be in the weather room. So if, if any of you have visited the center, you would maybe be familiar with this room. But just behind my cursor here, there's a little table and there's a little booth in here, which we colloquially call the, the fish tank. Or the fish um, and there are a couple of monitors here. And this is where I'd be sitting today, monitoring the forecast. And if we have the opportunity to visit you, uh, to invite you to the center in person, uh, I'd be standing roughly here and you would be in this weather room and I'd be presenting to you at the screen. So it's just to give you an idea, just try and position yourself in that room. We would be at that wall. Unfortunately, I can't see you there uh, under these circumstances, but um, that's where, where we are virtually, so to, so to speak. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through really two things and open it up for any questions. So firstly, I'd just like to show you what we actually do as a forecast analyst in terms of monitoring the ECMWF forecast system. As I say, really picking up perfectly from where Peter very nicely introduced our system. And I'll then just briefly introduce some of the work that, that I do in diagnostics. And then lastly, thirdly, open up any questions that you may have about what I've spoken about or anything else at, at the center for that matter. Before I get to what the actual forecast analyst does, I'm just gonna say, briefly what our different systems are, all within the integrated forecasting system. So we have a high resolution model, which I, I just list up here at the top of this slide. So this is our nine kilometer uh, resolution model. It's run twice a day. It goes out to 10 days, so twice a day from 00, zero UTC and 12 UTC. And this runs out, as I say, to 10 days. It's a nine kilometer grid and 137 vertical levels. So that's from the surface up to the top of the atmosphere. We then have an ensemble, is the same model, but it's run at an 18 kilometer resolution. It has fewer levels in the vertical, 19. And after 15 days, it goes down to a smaller resolution, truncates to 36 kilometers, apologies. And that ensemble is made up of 51 different members. We have a control member, which is basically the high resolution member without any perturbations. We then have 50 different members which account for the initial condition uncertainty and model uncertainties, which Peter introduced earlier. And then that ensemble is also coupled to the, to the ocean model from the start of the forecast. And to, in two particular forecasts in the week, we have what's called our extended rain system, which runs out to 46 days, and that's on Mondays and Thursdays. And then we also have the forecast, and, and Peter nicely showed the the El Nino or the ENSO forecast for the Nino 3.4 region. And that's run once a month from the first day of the month. It's an, an overview of the system. Um, so these are just a few examples which you would see on, on the weather wall. I'm gonna go into a few more details of these as we go through it. In particular, th this is the medium range forecast product. These are, I, um, that's not, not here by the way, but it's nice to hear feedback. Um, we have a monthly system, as you can see here. Again, Peter kindly introduced this. Then seasonal system. You can see the El Nino forecast here in this right-hand plume. And then these are more uh, products, forecast products for the uh, for the European Commission, for the European Union. We have global average temperatures here. You can see one the, so one over the globe and one over Europe. And then Eris as well. We're, we're part of the the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Service, which you can see here in the bottom right hand side. So before I get to these, so this hasn't come out exactly as I, I'm not actually in slideshow, but I, I will go through this with you. 
Um, so I'm, I'm a team of one of nine different analysts, and, and our main role is to have a look at the forecast one particular week. This, this is my particular week. And what we are interested in is how is the system performing? Are there any issues with observation coverage, with our verification scores? Do the forecasts look reasonable? And also some extreme events, which I will come on to later, and this is a very, very appropriate week for that particular avenue of thought. So this is sadly in, in um, slideshow mode, as I just said, but um, one of the key things are the observations. We need to know what is actually happening around the world at once. And so we can then get our initial condition, we can find out what is the state of the atmosphere, the best state of the atmosphere, and then we can run our model system from there. What, what I would have liked to have shown you before this is that one of the, the main data types that come in are satellite observations. Let's say, sadly, these are not shown on this slide, but satellite observations, you either have geostationary orbits, so that is a, a satellite at a particular fixed height above the atmosphere, and they can, they can tell you about the visible spectrum, the infrared spectrum, the water vapor spectrum. You then also have polar orbiting satellites or low Earth orbit satellites, which go over the poles and roughly will go over the same place twice a day. So these are very easy to, to work our system. What we've got here is two more conventional, or certainly the one on the, on the left is more conventional. The ones on the left, these are radio songs or, or weather balloons, as, as you might, uh, might say. And these, if we just have a look at the United States and Europe, you can see these green markers, these green triangles. These signify radio sound ascents, weather balloon ascents, and these are absolutely crucial in telling us what is going on in the, in the atmosphere at a particular point. So we can find the temperature, the humidity, and the winds, and the pressure at all of these locations. And of course, these also drift within the model and within the real world. So we can really gain a lot of information from these. One particular thing, as I say, it's quite an appropriate week to be giving this, this talk. If I can just ask you to have a look here, just off the Eastern Caribbean, so I think off the Leeward Islands here, there are some blue dots. These actually signify drop zones. Um, if I was at the center, I would actually show you this drop zone. We do have a couple at the center. So th this is a, a drop zone. This is roughly, I would say, 30 centimeters, maybe 45 centimeters tall, this little brown cylindrical um, capsule here. And this is obviously a parachute off the top. These are launched from aircraft, deployed from aircraft. In particular, this would be the US Air Force or um, the NOAA agency in the United States. And these, that they fly over the hurricanes or through the hurricanes and drop these drop zones. And these give us very valuable information of what the structure of the storms are like in terms of the winds, the temperature, humidity, as I, as I just mentioned. If I, okay, I will use the pointer. I think I had been using it, but I'll use it a little more. So the, the, these are the little blue dots here. Apologies. Thank you, Diana, for that comment. Um, so these are absolutely crucial to tell us what's going on. And obviously, flight level data is important as well to tell you what is actually happening with the system. If we then just move over to the right hand side, these are ocean buoys or drifters. Wherever you see these little blue dots, these are where we have pressure observations on a, on a little uh, buoy or drifter. Um, basically, these are roughly on the order of maybe two feet, so 60 centimeters uh, round, cylindrical. They're relatively heavy. They, they have a, a drogue on them, and then they can measure the sea surface temperature. And when I say a drogue, that, that makes them go to a at a speed at that of the uh, ocean currents. And what you can see here is that these cover areas where we don't have traditional observations, such as um, land surface stations. So th these are very key. I will come back to a, a field campaign later in this talk, which we've been involved in, which has been responsible for a, a large number of these ocean drifters off of Hawaii and California, but I'll come back to that at the end. So this is just to really highlight that observations are an absolutely critical part of our system to tell us what is happening with, with the atmosphere at a current time. 
So what do we do with all these observations? So, so this slide here, there's quite a bit going on here. So I'm, I'm just going to focus for the sake of time and for clarity on this top right panel here. So you can see the tropics from roughly 30 north to maybe 30 south, roughly, looking at that, 35 south. So what we're seeing here, these are the 200 hectopascal wind magnitudes. And what these are showing is that this is the difference between the observations that have come into the system and our short range forecast. So we have short range forecast. We then bring in the observations and we correct in a 4D um, data assimilation approach. We, we get our new best estimate of the initial state. And this just shows you how much the previous forecast has changed compared to our um, current forecast. You can't see the mouse. OK. Um, but I'm going to continue talking. I will, I, what I'll do is I'll just speak to the, I'll just tell you where I am on the page, top right or top left. At the moment, we're in the top right, so we're looking at the tropics. If I just ask you to look at um, just off of Florida and the southern United States, you can see quite large differences there between the observation and the model. And this is telling you that the, the model has changed quite significantly following the assimilation of observations. So that's producing the new analysis. If any of you have been in the UK, I'm not sure exactly where you all are. I know it's a University of Reading uh, summer school. Um, we've just experienced quite a nasty storm storm in Francis. It's especially quite deep and extreme for this time of the year. This is more of an autumnal or I would say a winter picture. But this is, this is what the high resolution forecast that I introduced earlier and that Peter nicely introduced. This is the high resolution forecast with Storm Francis located just to the west of the island of Ireland and the United Kingdom. And you can see the, the shaded areas, the purple and the blue, or the pink and the blue. This is signifying heavy rainfall. You can see the mean sea level pressure given by the black contours. And those are suggesting the depth of the cyclone. So at that point, it's roughly 990, I think, nine, even maybe a little, little lower hectopascals or millibars, and you can see the strong anti-clockwise circulation. So we've got a very strong westerly flow coming in to Ireland in the United Kingdom. And that was accompanied with weather warnings, strong gusts, some flooding as well across, across the country. So that, that's just an example of the high resolution forecast that we run at the center. But what was nicely introduced in the earlier talk is that we also have the ensemble forecast. And as we go further out, this is really what we would suggest people look at and really use, because this gives you an idea of the probability distribution of future states. What are the potential scenarios or forecasts that could occur as we go further out? So th this was taken from last Friday, so the 21st of August at 00 UTC. And you can see in the top here, we have the control member of the ensemble. So that's the top left. Uh, little stamp map, we call this a stamp map. The one to the right of that, so that's the top second left, so to speak, that's the high resolution forecast. And then all of these different maps, so the 10 by 5 panels that you see, these show the mean sea level pressure valid at midnight just gone, so about 12 hours ago. This shows you, this, this was the five day forecast for this particular storm across Europe. And you can see, I'm just going to show you member one. So this is now the second row, second row, first column, member one. You can see there's quite a nasty storm over the over the British Isles. If I then just look at um, another member, for example, and I did just see it before um, before I moved on. I mean, you can have a look at member 12, which you can probably see. It's the third row, third one across. It's a it's a weaker system. It just shows you that there's a difference between the different members. So it gives you an idea of what may occur in, in this particular domain. So this is one way of looking at it. It's obviously a huge amount of data to try and tease out some important information. But this is just to give you an idea of the differences you can see, which comes from the initial conditions, but also model uncertainty and predictability in the atmosphere, predictability issues. And there's another member here, which I think is member maybe 36, is that 36 I think. That's obviously um, quite different to what you see in the high resolution and the control. But this is just an example of what different forecasts we can actually look at. 
So another way of looking at the ensemble forecast, which would come out very nicely if we were at the weather wall on that first slide that I showed you, um, these are called meteograms. So some of you may be familiar, but I will just go through them just so, you, so we're on the same uh, page. So this is for Reading. This is um, that was the pointer, is it? Okay. Maybe is that there? Has that answered someone's question about a pointer? Possibly. Um, thank you very much for all these comments. I must say this is the first time I've ever used Blackboard. Um, right, I shall carry on. Um, so this is, these are the meteograms. So, th so if we just focus on this left-hand panel, this is the 10-day meteogram that we, we produce at the center. And for the moment, if we just focus on the bottom row, this is the two meter temperature that you see at different forecast lead times from the forecast on Friday. So this is the 21st of August. And you can see, if you just have a look at this 10 day meteorogram, where you see these box plots. So a box plot just describes the distribution, the probability distribution. Frequently the box will indicate the interquartile range from the 25th to the 75th percentiles. And then our little lines, which comes out clearer further along um, in, these, in, in these box plots, that tells you the first and the 99th percentile. So it gives you an idea of what is the extreme nature of, of the ensemble. So what you can see is we have an evolution here going out with time of temperature. And generally, there's a cooling trend, which if you're, if you're in the United Kingdom, you'll, you'll maybe be aware that we've gone into quite a westerly circulation and uh, a cooler period. You can also see the 10 meter wind speed, so it's the next one up, Storm um, Francis that I mentioned, it comes out relatively well here. That's at about day five lead time. You can also see the precipitation in the next row up, and then also the total cloud cover. So again, this is just a way of trying to condense a huge amount of information for a particular point um, into a meteorogram, into something which is tangible for a user to look at. Now, the one thing that I do like to, to show is the, the middle plot here, which is the 15 day meteorogram. And I think the key part of this plot here for, for users and especially for, for us on the, on the daily report is, so as the forecast analyst, is to really see how extreme is our forecast compared to what you'd expect at this time of the year, given the model climate. So I should just say what the model climate is. We run a, a model climate. So this is on a, a Monday and a Thursday. And we really run it to see what are the typical, typical conditions, apologies, at this time of the year. We can then put our current forecast into context and see how extreme they are compared to what we would expect. And we build that climate using the last 20 years of, of reforecast or model hindcast. You, you may have come across those, those terms. So if we just focus, as I say, just for the sake of time here, this is from last Friday. It was also a relatively windy day you can see that our 10 meter wind speeds in our model forecast. So this is the middle panel, second row up. This is the daily wind speed. You can see that our wind speed was outside of what we would expect in the model climate. So that would tell us that at this time of the year, it was an extremely um, windy day. It was, a, it was quite extreme compared to what we'd expect. And then just for completeness, so on the right hand side, these are the plumes. Uh, and these just show you the ensemble in a slightly different way. So you can see in the top, we have the temperature at 850 hectopascals. In the middle, we have the rainfall. And at the bottom, we have the, the geopotential height at 500 hectopascals. And again, these just show you how the model is evolving with time and um, really to try and identify particular patterns that are coming out. So you can see even from last Friday's forecast, if we just go upper row, um, so, so in here, we had quite a good indication that there was a chance of quite significant Tuesday, which is associated with, with storm chances. So we move on to the, the next slide. So I mentioned earlier that it's quite an appropriate week to be presenting this. So at the moment, most of my time is, is looking at the forecast with tropical cyclone Laura, Hurricane Laura which is in the Gulf of Mexico. We had one storm before that, tropical cyclone Marco, which was just off the coast of Louisiana. These are, again, the ensemble 
forecast for tropical cyclone Laura. So if you can see the, the map on the left-hand side of this current plot, these show what we call the plumes. These are the tracks of the, 50 mem the 51 members of tropical cyclone Laura within our forecast system. And the different colors of the lines, the black line at the start, the black lines, I should say, sorry, which represent the ensemble, this tells you where the forecast was due to be yesterday. The red line tell you where it should be today. So this is from yesterday's forecast. And then the green would be for tomorrow. So this is so it's day one in, in, in black, um, day two in, in red, and then green is day three. And then the system moves into the United States. And this is quite a, a significant system, certainly for Texas and, and Louisiana, for many of the people that live there. So this is one of the key ways that our forecast can be used it, for, for users and to, to help society as a whole. And if I just show you on the right hand side to so the bottom panel, this is the, the distribution of the central pressure. So again, you can see the ensemble showing how the system is deepening with time, roughly to a, um, to a depth of 980 hectopascals or millibars in that current forecast, I should add. And this is supposed to be the deepest this is tomorrow, so roughly at 12 UTC tomorrow. So you can just see how that system is, is progressing with time in that current, not current, in that forecast that was issued yesterday. And then you can see the wind speed here in the top, and then just a probability, which you can get from the ensemble of the tropical cyclone intensity. So obviously this is all key to what we're doing on the daily report as a forecast analyst in another room as I showed you earlier on. But one of the, the main things, so we issue forecasts, we look at the observations that come in obviously, but how well is our system actually performing? And this is one of the key parts of our of our role at the center on, on the daily report as the analyst. And I just wanted to show you a, just a couple of pictures here. So the first one, this is of what we call the 500 hectopascal geopotential, potential. And this gives us an idea of the large scale circulation. So how well is the ECMWF model actually performing compared to other centers? And just in general, how well is it doing? So if we just look at this top left plot, this is for the Northern Hemisphere extra tropic. So this is from 20 North, I think it's to, um, to 70 or 90 North. I can't remember, I can't see it on, on those slides, but it's basically, it's the Northern Hemisphere extra tropics. And what you can see, these are all the different modeling centers that we receive data for. ECMWF ourselves, we're in, in red, the UK Met Office is in blue, and the green is the Americans NTEF, and then there are other models shown by the different colors. And, and what we'd like to see is that the, so this is for the root mean square error at the top, we'd like to see that the red line has the lowest error out of all the, the different centers. I should say this is for our high resolution system. But what we're, we're also keen on seeing is how do all the models perform together? So if all the models go up together, so for example here, so if we look at all these different lines here where the cursor is now, that is roughly at Wednesday, I think it's at the 12th, looking at that little x-axis. If you see all of the systems having an error growing at that time or a larger error at that time, that would suggest that it's more to do with the predictability of the atmosphere. There's something that all the systems aren't picking up on. Whereas if you just see Let's just say, for example, the ECMWF model has a has a larger error, <clears throat> then it might be something more particular with our system, and that would warrant further investigation and diagnosis. Uh, but, but you can generally see that the models are performing well again towards the end of this, this cycle. ECMWF is at the bottom there, so it has the lowest error. And just to just to highlight the, the, the bottom panel very briefly is the anomaly correlation. So this is another way of looking at it. The top one is the root mean square error. It would be low. The anomaly correlation in the bottom row, we'd like, to, we'd like it to be as high as possible. So that means that our forecast anomalies and observed anomalies are tied up very well. So that's what we, we'd like to see there. So this is one way of looking at the forecast in terms of the large scale circulation. Another key part, which is something I work quite closely on, which is the precipitation, is to have a look at how well do the surface parameters actually verify. So this particular plot, this is for the total precipitation across Europe. This is uh, verifying on the 21st of August, so a few days ago. And what you can see, all of the little dots, these refer to the daily totals 
of rainfall across Europe, across the European landmass. And in the background, we have shading, and this represents our high resolution forecast on forecast roughly day two to day three, basically day three. And it shows how well has our system performed. So what to see is that the colors in our high resolution forecast match up quite well with what we see at the observed points. And generally, if we have a look at Norway, southern Norway here, there's a reasonably good association. I would also argue across Scotland and even into Eastern Europe as well. So it just gives you a very first glance at what is actually happening. So just to, just to give you a couple of slides on some of the work that I, I do when I'm not on the daily report, just to give more flavor to, to this talk remotely. So I, as I mentioned earlier, I work in diagnostics. So what we're interested in is diagnosing model errors, which is very appropriate given my work on the report. So just to go through a few things, colleagues of mine have a look at what we have called the ensemble of data assimilations, which is probably not time to go into that now. But this is partly how we, we get our initial conditions for our ensemble. And colleagues of mine will have a look at the variance in those to see what what do the short range forecasts look like? Where where is the variance coming from? So the, these budgets they, they have a one thing that I, I have worked on charge on the next slide is the stream forecast index for water vapor fluxes. So that goes back to the on precipitation, which I mentioned on the previous slide, but I will come on to that in the next slide. We're keen on regime transitions, something that Peter brought up if you're going from Let's say cold conditions to warm conditions, or from, let's just say a high pressure system to low pressure systems, for example, or the other way around. How well to capture those regime transitions and work closely on that, as well as tracking errors in the system. And the, the aim of all of it is really to improve our ability to diagnose errors, to then feed back to the research department to improve our, our model system. And just to give you a couple of examples. So some of the work I've done is I've had a look at what, what they call atmospheric rivers and extreme rainfall. Just to go through very briefly what this is, I can see the, the sands of time are running out here for me. Uh, the atmospheric river, it's, a, it's an area within an extra tropical cyclone. It transports huge amounts of water vapor across the atmosphere, across the mid-latitudes, mostly in the low, low, lower levels, pardon me, as I, as you can see here in this right panel, most of it is in this red area, transporting it across the Atlantic, the Pacific, also across the, the southern hemisphere as well. And it's when these areas match up with, with orography, mountains, land masses, that we can really have significant um, effects. And just to show you an example on the next slide. So this is the Storm Dennis on the left hand side. This is the extreme forecast index. This is very similar to the 15 day meteorogram that I showed you earlier. This is trying to put the current forecast, this was a forecast back in February, not actually the current, but a forecast in the context that we would expect in terms of the model climate at this time of the year. And if you see these yellow, red colors, these warm colors, that's where it is much more likely that you will have an extreme water vapor flux, which did actually capture the rainfall within Storm Dennis, which affect Northwest Europe quite significantly in February, it really did show it quite nicely compared to what we could do with the rainfall uh, or the total precipitation extreme forecast index. And then just one other further comment I mentioned about the Eastern Pacific Ocean. These are, so there is a campaign called Atmospheric River Reconnaissance, which we're closely linked with. And I mentioned two things in, at the beginning of this talk. One was drop zones. You might remember that little that little picture I showed you a while ago uh, on the slides. All of these little black dots on these uh, right-hand panels, these represent drop zone locations that we used in our ECMWF system. These were launched from aircraft ranging from 30,000 to 45,000 feet, so 300 to 150 millibars pascals. And these were all assimilated into our system. They were taken in, similar to the ones that you saw for the hurricanes in the Caribbean. And these are really, really key to tell us how is our model actually doing in resolving the atmospheric river storm features across the Pacific Ocean. So you can see that in this 
in this panel here on the right hand side, you can see the water vapor fluxes in the background and then the black dots for the, for the drop zone. And I should also add a lot of those ocean drifters that I, I mentioned earlier, they were also deployed or launched in this data sparse area. And we're really interested in, in adding to this observation coverage, not just for the local area, but it goes back to a key point that Peter made in the previous talk. If we can better capture the, the, the atmospheric circulation, the background um, forecast in this area, we hope, we hypothesize that it will help our forecast, which we're, of course, most interested in, as well as globally, but it, we, we really are interested in, in, in Europe. Um, so that's really all I wanted to, to cover today. I'd be very happy to take any questions. I hope that's been clear enough. Uh, it would be very nice to have met you personally. Um, maybe that will be possible in the future, but I just wish you all the very best, and I hope you're keeping safe well. And the rest of summer school, that's most important. And I think